We want to thank you very much for being here. It's such an incredible crowd. And, Bob, I want to thank you in particular for your leadership in the Hispanic community and for your amazing work as CEO of the largest Latino-owned business in America, Goya. Goya. Do we know Goya? We love Goya. Well, you know, he was uh, hit pretty hard, and uh, they really went after him, the radical left, let's call it. And they went after him at a level like few people have ever seen. And you know what the result is? His business doubled. Everyone went out and bought Goya. I was even saying, get me some Goya cans of whatever the hell you're serving. I'll take it. But he's a fantastic guy and a brave man and a great businessman. And we appreciate it. Really a fantastic representative of the Hispanic community. It's a pleasure to be here in Miami. I love Miami. I have Doral right down the road. Good old Doral. Doing great. So many wonderful friends at the Hispanic Leadership Conference, and I especially want to thank America First Policy Institute President Brooke Rollins and all of the incredible people. Bienvenido. Bienvenido. I have to say that. And the Hispanic Impact Panel. And sit down, everybody. We'll be here for a little while. We want to talk. What the heck? What else do we have to do today? We're going to talk. We have plenty of time, and I appreciate such a great turnout and a lot of press. Whoa! They must be expecting. They must be expecting something very big to be. Ooh. They got the whole group back there. We're grateful to be joined as well by representatives Mario Diaz Bellart, my friend. Thank you very much. Where is Mario? Stand up, Mario. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Carlos Jimenez, Carlos, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And former SBA administrators, Linda McMahon, who she's a legend, and she was so great. She did such a good job. Thank you. And Jovita, where is Jovita? Jovita, she has been incredible. She made small business administration into big business administration. Jovita Carranza. And thank you very much. And former acting Homeland Security Secretary Chad Wolf, I think we could use Chad in a position over there right now as people pour into our country by the millions. Where's Chad? Thank you very much, Chad. Thank you. And uh, people are pouring into our country by the millions and millions and millions, and we have no idea who they are, where they come from. It's a horrible thing happening to our country. State Senator Alina Garcia, where are you? Where are you? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great, great job you're doing. Becoming a legend. <laughs> Incoming Speaker of the Florida House of Representatives, a fantastic person, Danny Perez. Danny, thank you, Danny. Good job, Danny. Great job. Candidate for Miami-Dade County Commission, Kevin Cabrera. Kevin, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Oh, a friend of mine, he's uh, just, you just don't want to fight him. Jorge Masvidal. Hey, don't get into a fight with him. I'll fight Steve Cortez, though, but I won't fight Jorge. I won't fight a champ. I'll fight Steve. But you're a champ in other ways, right? And Lee and Denise Rizzuto, uh, the, what a great businessman. Conair. Conair, you ever hear anybody who uses, you know, I use it to dry my beautiful locks. Conair. And uh, two incredible, incredible people and a great businessman, and we appreciate it very much you being here. Thank you, thank you very much, Denise. And also many distinguished guests, incredible, really, really successful people, largely in this case in the Hispanic community, and it's uh, just a great community, and it's going more and more. I know it's going more and more for Trump, but I think it's going more and more for the Republican Party, and they should be, actually, when you look at what's happening. Let me begin today by expressing our boundless sympathy and love for everyone affected by the horrific devastation of the recent monster hurricane. It was a monster. Our hearts ache for every person whose home was damaged or destroyed, for every community that has been so horribly ravaged, and for every family that has lost a precious loved one to this terrible storm. And it's turning out to be a number that would not happy with at all. It's a big number, and you could see that when you look at the devastation. It had to be a big number. It's terrible. 
We also thank God for the Coast Guard and the National Guard and law enforcement always and first responders and countless others who have stepped forward in this time of need. And God bless our governor and God bless all of the mayors, all of the mayors. And they're all working so hard and they're heroes. And uh, we're going to get through this in Florida. Nobody can believe a storm of that magnitude and uh, the kind of damage it did. We will persevere through this challenge and we will rebuild and come back together as one nation. We'll be stronger and better, but we still pray for those lives that have been lost because that we cannot bring back. That's the one thing we cannot bring back. As we continue to pray for a swift recovery, we're here this afternoon to celebrate one of the fastest growing groups in the entire country, proud Hispanic conservatives and Republicans. The left, the media, and the Washington establishment, they never saw it coming. You never saw it coming, did you, CNN? <laughs> but today, Hispanic Americans are joining our movement by the millions and millions and millions. <laughs> Hispanics are rallying to our cause for a simple reason, because you love America and you believe in America and you know that the time has come to stand up and defend America and everything it stands for. Generations of Hispanic citizens have helped forge our communities, found our churches, build our small businesses, and police our streets, teach our children, protect our borders, serve in our military, and lift up our nation in a million different ways. There is no industry that Hispanic Americans have not made stronger and better. And we have so many representatives in that room who lead those industries, like Bob and so many others. It's really incredible. There is no city that Hispanic Americans have not made better. And there is no part of America that has not been uplifted by Hispanic Americans and not made greater. The Hispanic community is a blessing to our nation. But today we are watching as everyone. We worked so hard. We all work so hard to build together as absolutely being ripped apart. We are now, and it's a very sad thing to say, a nation in decline. We are a nation in decline. So sad to say it, we are a failing nation. America is supposed to be the land of hope and freedom and opportunity. But under the Biden administration, it has become a land of recession, probably depression. And when you think of it, repression and misery and fear, it's actually become a nation of fear. Over the next 12 months, inflation will cost average families more than $8,500 each. Who would ever think that's possible? Could be worse than that. Among all demographic groups, according to the Federal Reserve, inflation is hitting Hispanic Americans the hardest of any group. Wages for Hispanic Americans declined by nearly 4% last quarter. Think of that. Under Biden and the radical left Congress, 26 million low-income households have had their life savings completely wiped out, obliterated. Household wealth has seen the largest drop ever recorded, $6.1 trillion last quarter alone, and it could be much higher than that when the final numbers come in. The stock market has lost $7.6 trillion in value. And your 401ks, I don't have to ask you, are doing terribly. Meanwhile, the murder rate is the highest in many, many years. And the number of Hispanic homicide victims is up 40% since the radical left began its anti-police crusade two years ago. The big banks like Chase and like Bank of America have done much less for the Hispanic community than they should. They've gone woke, and they should be penalized very severely for it. The banks have let the community down. I think they've let the country down. Biden is not only wrecking our economy, he's destroying the rule of law. You probably read and heard about the document hoax. Has anyone heard about the document hoax, helicopters flying over Mar-a-Lago? Well, they've given us about $5 billion worth of free publicity, I will say. People said, that's a nice house. If it weren't so nice, they probably wouldn't be doing it because, you know, it gets ratings. When they look, they said, that's a beautiful place. <laughs> they raided and broke into my home. 
Everyone knows we've done nothing wrong. They are targeting me because they want to silence me, silence you, and silence our amazing Make America Great Again movement. There's never been a movement like this in the history of our country, not even close. The weaponized Department of Justice and the politicized FBI are spending millions and millions of dollars on this continued witch hunt, which started in various forms, all different forms, Russia, 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 impeachment hoax number one, impeachment hoax number two, the Mueller report, which ended in no collusion at the end of $48 million and two and a half years. But it was in various forms on the day I came down the golden escalator in Trump Tower many years ago. So how do we know this document hoax is indeed a hoax or a charade? Just look at how every other president has been treated when they left office. They've been given all the time needed and complete deference when it came to their documents and their papers. No other president has been harassed and persecuted like we have. I speak on behalf of you too. Barack Hussein Obama moved more than 20 truckloads, over 33 million pages of papers, classified and unclassified, to a poorly built and totally unsafe former furniture store with no security whatsoever. Bill Clinton took millions and millions of documents from the White House to his home in Arkansas. No security. Then it was reported that NARA, you know what NARA is? National Archives, you know that. NARA, which is a radical left-run agency. I don't know if you know that. Radical left, seriously radical left, lost a whole hard drive of information from the Clinton White House. Ooh, I wonder what was on there. <laughs> lost is in quotes, quote, it lost. They're still searching for it. This is many years ago. They're still searching for it. But you can just imagine, and NARA is so woke and broken that they even placed a warning label on, of all things, the Constitution of the United States, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence, claiming that these great American documents contain harmful language. That's a beauty. That's up there with taking the name George Washington off the high school. George W. Bush transported millions of documents from the White House to an unguarded warehouse in Texas. The records of George H. W. Bush administration were moved to a bowling alley that was combined with a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> and remember, Mar-a-Lago is not only walled off, very secure, and totally safe, but it's also guarded by dozens of very strong and powerful U.S. Secret Service agents, although if you listen to this one very sick individual, in order to get the Secret Service to take me to the Capitol, I grabbed one around the neck. <laughs> and I, and you know, I almost didn't want to dispute it because a lot of people said, I never knew you were that physically tough. <laughs> this guy was a tough guy that I supposedly grabbed. If I grabbed him around the neck, I think I would have been in serious trouble. I would have needed Jorge to bail me out. No, they make up things, and uh, when they find out it's a phony story, they don't want to put it down that it was, a, it was a totally make. Can you imagine that? That was a step too far. You know, sometimes they go too far, and people say, oh, that couldn't have happened. That could not have happened. That didn't happen. And, of course, we cannot forget that crooked Hillary Clinton completely deleted at least 33,000 government emails, many classified, after receiving a congressional subpoena. This is after she gets a subpoena from Congress. And she deletes 33,000 emails. And her lawyer said, well, those emails had nothing to do with anything except for her daughter's wedding and yoga. Yeah. Right? <laughs> she was studying yoga. <laughs> Think of it, 33,000, that's a lot of work. <laughs> but nothing happened. They didn't do anything, right? But with me, they do things. She used bleach bit. You know what that is? Very expensive process. Nobody uses it because it's too expensive to make sure that you never find the emails. But they're around. We'll find them. They'll come out someday. They're in the State Department, in my opinion. And then she proceeded to have her staff destroy her phones with hammers. They pounded the hell out of them. I don't know how they found out. I think they found a couple of them. 
They didn't even recognize them as phones, so they did a very good job, actually. But they found them. But now the failing Biden regime wants to start investigating me, and the only reason is because I'm leading everybody in the polls, both Republicans and Democrats, by a lot. And I just say this, uh, when should we expect, you know, this is many years now, when should we expect a Bush one document investigation? Yeah, it's a long time. And how about a Bush two document investigation? And when is Bill Clinton investigation starting? And are they beginning to look at Obama warehouse investigation? When is that, next week or this week? How about this week? There's definitely no doubt that Hillary should have perhaps been charged. They decided not to even think about it. The document hoax is just that. It's a hoax and a charade, and I'm being unjustly, illegally, and unconstitutionally targeted. It's a violation of the Fourth Amendment. You know that? And Right, Ray Chappaqua. Only a Hispanic could say that. Who said that? <laughs> Stand up, sir. Ray Chappaqua. That's... It's a very interesting idea. But because they know we're right and uh, we will win and we will continue to win at every level and that's what we've been doing. But I wanted to just give that as a little brief statement. When you think of the uh, unfair table setting, when you think of how unfairly we've been treated, we as a group have been treated. It's just terrible. And we have to bring our country back. We have to stop the weaponization because the people of our country are hurt they're angry and they're sad. Our country is a very sad country right now. They've seen what's happened in two years. I say, and I say it quite often, no president. You could add five of them together, take our five worst. They haven't done damage to this country like has been done in the last two years. True. So ladies and gentlemen, we are on a mission to restore the republic to greatness for the Hispanic Americans and for all Americans. We're talking about all Americans. We had it prior to the uh, China virus coming in, I call it, because I want an accurate name as opposed to COVID. But we had a country the likes of which has never, nobody ever came close to us. We were doing numbers that were incredible. We were just destroying China and everybody else in terms of our percentage, in terms of our financials in terms of everything we were doing. We were, you know, they always said China was going to catch us in 2019. We were gaining on them. I said, if we have intelligent presidents, we'll never be behind China, even though they have slightly more people than we do, like about a billion more. They have 1.5 billion. We have actually, our country is so crazy now, we don't even know how many we have. We have no idea. Because I believe the number of people that came into our country and will come in, this year is 10 million people, not 3 million. Could even be 12 million people. We have absolutely no idea what it is. So it's hard to say how many people we have because we have no idea how many people have come into our country illegally. But we already know what we must do. That we know. Our America First agenda is a proven path to safety, opportunity, and success can bring our nation back from the brink of ruin. Our nation is at the brink of ru ruin. We're going to be Venezuela on steroids. I used to say that two years ago during the campaign. I'd say, well, we're going to end up being Venezuela on steroids. You know what happened? Because Venezuela 21 years ago was a very prosperous country, and today it's uh, horrible. Of course, we'll make it prosperous again because we don't take our oil that's under our feet, Pamela, right? We don't take what's under our feet. I call it liquid gold. We go to them to get far inferior product that we refine in the United States. You know, we have the only refiners because what they have is tar. It's very rough. It's not light and it's not sweet. It's rough stuff. And they talk about the environment. So they're going to Venezuela to get stuff that's really bad. It's refined in the United States. So if there is anything goes in the air, it goes in the air in the United States. But even if it went to another country, it blows over. The whole thing is so crazy. What they're doing is so crazy. So we're begging Venezuela, we're begging Saudi Arabia, we're begging everybody for oil, and we have more than everybody right under our feet, liquid gold. Over four incredible years, we did more for the Hispanic community than any administration in the history of our country. 
Under our leadership, household incomes for Hispanic Americans reached an all-time high, and the Hispanic American unemployment rate reached an all-time low. That's a nice combination, right? And they were big numbers. Over 1.5 million Hispanic American citizens were lifted out of poverty. Hispanic American poverty hit the lowest rate ever recorded. Under our leadership, the household wealth of the median Hispanic family grew by an astounding 65%. That's in a short period of time. And if you looked at it just prior to the plague coming in from China, the numbers were numbers that nobody could even believe. I remember a very famous pollster, very well-known, John McLaughlin, came to my office just prior to the plague coming in. He said, sir, if George Washington and Abraham Lincoln came alive from the dead and they formed a president, vice president team, you would beat them by 40 percent. That's how good our numbers were. And then we did it again. We went through that horrible. We did, uh, I mean, we did so many incredible things. And the stock market was higher when we handed it over, unfortunately handed it over for what? The stock market was higher, think of that, was higher than, frankly, than it is now also. But it was actually higher than it was prior to the plague coming in. So it's an, it was an amazing thing, but I'll never forget that. Because that would be a tough tandem, George Washington and Abraham. Ladies and gentlemen, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln have announced that they will be running for president and vice president. I would say, oh, man, that's tough. <laughs> that's a tough one. Home ownership among Hispanic Americans reached the highest level in history. And to make it easier to start and grow a family, we doubled the child tax credit for 40 million Hispanic Americans. We doubled it up. We slashed taxes and regulations for countless Hispanic-owned small businesses. And in all fairness, we did for the entire country. We got the largest tax cut in the history of our country, larger than the Reagan tax cut. It's the largest tax cut. And now they're going to be doubling your taxes. And if you add the damage of inflation, uh, that's like a quadrupling of your taxes. Under my administration, the annual revenue of the average Latino-owned small business increased by a staggering 85% before the pandemic. The Hispanic American high school graduation rate reached an all-time high, highest in history. And the dropout rate reached, again, an all-time low. And we did all of this and more by cutting taxes, slashing job-killing regulations, demanding fair trade for the American worker. We got rid of the horrible NAFTA deal. We replaced it with USMCA. They want to renegotiate the deal now. Mexico and Canada want to renegotiate the deal. That's how I know it's so good. I knew it was great. It's one of the great deals ever made in trade. We made a great deal also with China. I just don't talk about it because after the, after the plague came in, I don't know, I don't even talk about it. We made an incredible deal for our farmers and our manufacturers, but I don't even talk about that one. That was a great deal, though. Still in existence, I doubt they're probably adhering to it so much anymore because they have to respect leadership in order to adhere to it. But they adhered to it when I was there. $50 billion worth of purchases. And unleashing American energy to unlock the American dream, because the American dream is rapidly leaving. But for the Hispanic Americans, it'll never leave. You people never give up. You don't give up. You know, very entrepreneurial people. Nobody says that. But you're very entrepreneurial, amazingly successful, incredible, energetic. Uh, but very entrepreneurial. The moment we restore the American first policies, the economy will take off like a rocket ship. But to fully restore our economy, we must first restore public safety. We have a very unsafe nation. You see it every night on television. You see scenes that we've never seen where hundreds of people run into stores, knock the hell out of everyone and grab everything. And within minutes, the entire store is emptied out. And they don't allow the police to do their job. They destroy the police if they do. They take away their pension. They take away their job. Their family is destroyed. We have to let the police do their job. We have to give police back their respect and their safety. And we have to do it now. And without safety in our country, safety on our streets, and without allowing police to do their job as they can only do it, not to fund the police, just to fund the police. They're starting it again. They're starting it again. Defund the police. They really believe this. 
These people are insane, or they hate our country. I don't know which. Maybe it's both. <laughs> they say both. I think so. But there can be no prosperity without safety. That's why Hispanic Americans have no interest in whatsoever, just whatsoever in defunding. Latinos do not want reimagined. We don't want reimagined public safety. They want to reimagine it. Oh, somebody's breaking into our house. In a couple of cities, it takes hours to respond, hours. I don't want to mention which ones, but you know, you've been reading about it. One city, it takes four hours prior to getting there. Boy, can you imagine what these people are going to do to innocent Americans, innocent people? It's, it's just horrible. Four hours for the police. I'm sorry we can't be there for four hours as somebody's breaking your door down. Like all Americans, Hispanic Americans want law and order. That was the thing that they missed when I ran in 2016. We did better in 2020, by the way, by a lot than we did in 2016, getting millions of more votes. We did much better. You know, they said somebody, one of these people said to me, what was the difference between 2016 and 2020? What did you do differently? Meaning, you know, like you won in 2016. I said, well, the difference is we got millions more votes in 2020. We'd actually ran a much better campaign. But uh, when you look at what's happened and when you look at all of the things that are going on, we have to get back to common sense. People ask me, are you a conservative? I say, you know what I am? I'm a person with common sense. I want to see borders. I want to see great education. I want to see a strong military. I want to see things that are... I want to see a strong police force so that bad things don't happen. The next Congress must pass emergency funding so we can hire thousands more police officers nationwide and put violent criminals behind bars and keep them behind bars. Leave our police alone. Just leave our police alone. Give them back that respect. They all know what to do. It's something I stress it, and I stress it again and again, and I'll say it again and again because we have to do that. I mean, I see strong cops watching and looking at people ravaging stores and ravaging cities, and they want to do something so bad, and they're told, you better not do it. Everything is on the line for you. You better not do it. Securing our streets also requires securing our borders. One of the worst lies of the radical left is that Hispanic Americans want open borders. See, when I ran, I was talking about a wall. <laughs> You're right about that. No, but when I ran, I said, the wall. And you know who was the first to embrace it? And we built an unbelievable amount of wall, and we completed that whole thing, and then we said we have to build more. And in three weeks, that could have been completed. And we had the strongest border in history. But what they said is, oh, you're going to lose the Hispanic American vote. I said, but I have to do what's right. And it was just the opposite. I didn't do it because I thought I was going to get it or not do it. I was just doing what had to be done. And we did it, and we had the best numbers ever. But we also had the best numbers along the border. We had the best numbers for Hispanic Americans that anybody's ever even imagined. In 2020, we won... I think every single border town, and I was called by the governor of Texas, who's doing a very good job, and hopefully we're not going to have Beto, who says no guns, no God, and no oil. Think, how does a guy run in Texas say no guns, no God, no oil? <laughs> no, think of it. But the governor called me. He said, you know, you did something that's unprecedented. You want every single area along the border. One, not that I didn't go to 30 percent or 20 percent, you know, which was a lot more than Republicans had done. We won. And he said, not since Reconstruction. I said, you can you define Reconstruction as the Civil War? I asked that question. He said, yes, not since the Civil War. Has anybody done anything like that? I said, that's a long time. Could we say from the beginning, the very beginning, or do we have to only go back to the Civil War? He said, I don't know beyond the Civil War, but... He said, not since Reconstruction has anybody done that. You can look at the numbers. It's incredible. And we're continuing that. And I think we're even more popular right now, Bob, with the Hispanic population. Hispanic Americans are really uh, first and foremost in so many ways in our country, the job they've done. They, they want great jobs. They want rising wages. They want safe neighborhoods, outstanding schools. They want drug-free communities, all of which require a policy of strong border security. And if you want uh, drug-free, you know what you have to do. We're going to talk about it in a second, but two years ago, we had the strongest border 
American history. Now I believe we have the weakest border anywhere in the world. I don't think there's a third world nation that has a border where millions of people are allowed to pour in. If they had to use rocks and stones, they're not going to let it happen. We have millions and millions, and nobody has a clue where the hell they're coming from. And as you know, the communities most affected by illegal immigration are the Hispanic communities, and the Hispanic people knew that. The pollsters didn't know that. The writers didn't know that. They may have known it, but they don't write it, so we expect that anyway, because we have a very dishonest press. Very, very dishonest. Hispanic Americans, now the cameras start to go off. Oh, those red lights. They go, here we go, let's turn off the cameras. Hispanic Americans understand that there's nothing compassionate about empowering human traffickers and child smugglers who extort, rape, abuse, and even sell migrants into slavery. There is nothing virtuous about surrendering America's borders to transnational gangs and murderers and criminal cartels. Tough people. They're making a fortune. By the way, they're making more money than the biggest people on earth. You know, you look at some of the big businessmen. Oh, I have such respect. These people are making more money than all of them because of our stupid government. Stupid, stupid government. Some of our nation's closest neighbors are being literally destroyed by these gangs and these cartels. An estimated 100,000 Mexican civilians have been horrifically murdered or disappeared. It's the, most, uh, it's the most unsafe country right now, sadly, in the world, Mexico, at the hands of the drug cartels. I get along very well with your president. I have a very good... He's a so, he is a socialist, but you know what? I still... I. Really liked him. I got along with him fantastically. I think he's a great gentleman. Different persuasion, but a great gentleman. But he's having a tough time with that. And uh, hopefully he's going to get it. But he's a good man and he wants to get it. But not to mention the millions of people harmed and killed by their deadly poisons coming out of, a lot of them coming out of China. And I had that pretty well stopped, too. We were stopping the fentanyl. I said to the president, you have to stop it. This is like an act of war. We're going to lose 250,000 people, in my opinion, this year to drugs. Not 100,000 that Joe is here. It's been 100,000 for 20 years. It's going to be 250. There's no war like that. Unless you get into nuclear war and we're in big trouble because a thing like that could happen. If we're so stupid, a thing like that could happen. This is one of the greatest assaults on human life and human dignity of our time. It's happening at the border. What's happening with the drugs? It's being inflicted upon... Mexico also and other nations of Latin America at the hands of the drug cartels and their allies in the Democrat Party. They're allies. Democrats' open border policies are funneling these vicious cartel billions and billions of dollars, the money, with which to oppress and massacre and terrorize innocent people in other countries. And it's so preventable. We had it at a level that would have been by this time, I think we would have wiped them out. I was told that somebody leaked. You know, they leak when they get paid a lot of money. They're great Trump people. And then they say, we'll give you a million dollars if you want to say something bad. You know, when they want to write a good book, nobody's interested. When they, then they say, well, we'll pay you a lot of money if you say bad. Well, and some of them go over to the dark side. They'll say, I'll take it. But they leaked that I wanted to hit the cartels with missiles. And... Everybody, he just said, why not? Yeah, who stand up? Said, I don't know. And everyone said, oh, what a terrible thing to say. And then a lot of people said, well, that's a good idea. They would say, that's a good idea. No, they, somebody leaked that I wanted to do that. I won't say I don't comment on things like that. They shouldn't be leaking out, but people get paid a lot of money. You know, in other administrations, nobody cared. There was a lot of leaking in all of them, I think, Pamela. But, you know, nobody really cared. When they leak on my administration, uh, some people think it's so glamorous, it's so great. So it's a little bit different, but no, they leaked out that I wanted to hit him with Patriot missiles during the day when everyone's in there working hard, when the, when the guys that are taking billions and billions of dollars a year are counting up their cash. Under my administration, we declared war on the cartels. That was a war, and it was a very effective one, and it would have been over fairly quickly until this... Horrible result happened in the election. Partnering with 22 nations in the region, we achieved the largest surge of military assets in the Western Hemisphere and in modern history. 
I sent the Navy, the Coast Guard, and the Air Force to intercept narco traffickers. Nobody's ever done anything like what we did. Never got, I don't think it ever got written about what we did on the seas because they started to have a hard time at the border with the wall and with the fact that I got Mexico to put up 28,000 soldiers to guard our territory while we were building the wall. They didn't want to do that, and they said, we're not doing that. We wouldn't even think about doing that. I said, that's okay. We're going to tariff all of your cars at the rate of 25% a year. They said, we would love to give you soldiers free of charge. It's <laughs> cool. would be our great honor to give you the 28,000 that we just rejected under no circumstances. They said, under no circumstances will we do that. I said, all right. And I had the order done, signed. On Monday morning, this was a Thursday, I said, on Monday morning, 25% tariff. On all cars, you know, they stole 32% of our automobile making business. I said, 25% tariff on all cars coming into the United States. And they said, uh, we would uh, be greatly honored to provide the soldiers for you. So we had 28,000 soldiers in a period of about two days. I was impressed. I didn't know they could mobilize so quickly. <laughs> the next time a Republican president has the chance, we must once again make it an urgent national security priority to crush the cartels, show them no mercy, and to end their reign of terror once and for all. <laughs> or we're not going to have a country either. Here in the United States, you know, they spend all their time on nonsense, the FBI, on horrible things, and raiding Mar-a-Lago. Let's, let's raid Mar-a-Lago, but leave the cartels alone. How about that? Think, think of this. I'm just thinking as I'm speaking. You don't mind if I go a little off script? No, but think. They raided Mar-a-Lago, but the cartels, they, they have their own Mar-a-Lagos, and those are fine. Leave them alone. Let them continue to destroy our country. Think how sick it is. Think how sick it is what's happening in this country. We're a country of investigations. We don't talk about greatness anymore. Everybody gets investigated. So all they do is investigate. And it's very much a one-way street. I never liked it because I thought it was very bad for the country. But honestly, ultimately, it comes on the other side. It comes on the other side. People say, gee, we remember. It's terrible. But these cartels, nothing's happening to them. But they go after politicians. They go after people that are fighting like hell on the vote. They don't do the people that defrauded on the vote. They do the people that question and show proof that there was a fraudulent election. Those people are persecuted, but the people that stole the votes are left alone. You look at Philadelphia, you look at Detroit, you look at Atlanta, you look at these cities that were so corrupt, nothing happens. But the people that question the corruption, they get investigated and go through hell, and they try and ruin their lives. Here in the United States, we must also impose the most severe penalties for drug dealers who during the course of their lives, I don't know if you know this, will kill an average of 500 American citizens, anybody but American citizens in this case. Think of it, a drug dealer, an average drug dealer, will kill 500 people during the course of his life by selling drugs. And that doesn't mention also the fact that so many families are being destroyed. I just tell this one quick story. You hear it at the rallies, but it's uh, such a, uh, I think it's such a great story because I got to be very friendly with President Xi and a lot of them. I give you an example. Putin, where it would have never happened, you would never have Russia right now in Ukraine. You would never in a million years, it wouldn't be there. So sad when I see all these people being killed, it's got to, it's got to stop. They've got to negotiate a deal, but it's got to stop, but it would have never happened. But I was with President Xi of China, a very powerful man, very strong person, very smart. You know, when I call him smart, the press says, he called him smart. Well, he gets 1.5 billion people with an iron fist. I guess he's smart, right? Maybe more than smart, Linda, right? But uh, they get very upset when I say that people are smart. But he is, and I was with him, and I said to him, perhaps in his opinion somewhat naively, President, President, do you have a drug problem in China? No. He looks at me like, what kind of a stupid question is that? Of course, <laughs> 1.5 billion people. Do you ever know? No. Uh, why do you ask? Well, I was just curious. We have a drug problem. Partially caused, as you know, by China. They have a drug problem. They make drugs for the United States, okay? That's their drug. I said, don't do that anymore. But I said, so do you have a drug problem? No, no, no. I said, uh, what do you attribute that to? Quick trial. And he said, okay, tell me, what's a quick trial? 
if somebody is caught in China selling drugs, he is given a trial quickly. And if guilty, they are immediately executed. And drug dealers decide that they don't want to sell drugs because China's had massive problems over the centuries with drugs, with the opium, you know. And they were taken over by weak nations in some cases because everybody was drugged out. They saw what happened. So they give the death penalty, and I'm calling for the death penalty for drug dealers and human traffickers. And you're going to stop crime in this country at a level, at a level that nobody will believe. Crime will go down, in my opinion, over 80 percent in one day if it's a meaningful death penalty. You know, now we have blue ribbon committees composed of Pam Bondi, Linda McMahon, and other people that are very good. And then some people that aren't very good. Some people, socialites, lots of people. People that are doing it because they want to get the name in the paper with these people back there. But uh, it's, uh, they don't care. It's just, there's nothing you can do. The only thing that's going to stop it, there's only one thing that's going to stop it, the death penalty. If somebody is selling drugs in a meaningful way, but selling drugs, they get the death penalty. And as President Xi said, they've decided they won't sell drugs in China. Same in Singapore. Singapore, very rich, but they have a very strong death penalty for drug dealers. And they, uh, they don't, nobody sells drugs. They go someplace else, like the United States, where you don't even get put in prison. Nothing happens. With the help of countless Hispanic conservatives joining in our movement, we will restore the rule of law. We will restore the values of God and family and country, which is what we all want. One of the first things that we must do when we have Congress and the White House is to stand up for parents' rights. Can you imagine, I'm saying this, can you imagine 10 or 15 years ago, 20, say, we have to stand up for parents' rights? I mean, parents' rights are under attack. But can you imagine, you're, I guess I'm a politician, you know, I'm supposed to be like, I don't consider myself a politician. Maybe it's the reason I've done well in politics. I don't know, but, but I don't consider. But think of it. I'm standing up for parents' rights. You'd think that, like, parents' rights are automatic, right? But that's what we have to do. The radical left, Marxist educators, and they're all over the place. It's shocking. Where do these people come from? Have no right to raise your children or to push their perverse racial and sexual and political material into their faces and put it onto our youth. We will not let these lunatics destroy the American family. We will not let it happen. And I had it largely stopped. I had it stopped. I had it stopped in the military. I had it stopped in the military. First day they came back, they reinstituted. We fired all these people. Some of them were making $400,000 a year to teach stuff to our military that was so bad. Uh, we. We were teaching fighting. We were teaching how to fight, how to win wars. That's what our military wants. At long last, every parent in America must be empowered to opt out of the insanity of sending their child to, and you have to do, you have to, you have to be allowed to get your child to go to, because it's insane what they're doing right now, to public private, charter, religious, home schools of their choice. The word being choice. Choice is very important in education because what they're doing now is insane. We will also keep men the hell out of women's sports. I tell it all the time. The swimmer whose records are broken by 38 seconds, you know, wanted to break it by an eighth of a second. The weightlifter who gets wiped out by somebody that hasn't really lifted too much. And uh, so I, it's actually very demeaning to women, if you want to know. I mean, one thing I will say, they have records that will not soon be broken. You know, when, in the case of the swimmer, I think it was one-eighth of a second, looking to gain one-eighth of a second after years of working one-eighth. And this a person, it, it, they say, in in a man's body. That's what they use that term. I said, are you allowed to use that term? They said, yeah, that term is acceptable. That's strange. It'll be wiped out pretty soon, so I'll say it quickly, in a man's body. But this person in a man's body uh, broke the record by 38 seconds. I don't think, Linda McMahon, that one will be broken too fast, right, by women. But no teacher should ever be allowed to teach transgender to our children without parental consent. No, nobody has to have parental consent. 
And we will totally oppose the Biden administration, this, this administration, the Biden administration's sick plan to require mandatory counseling for children who don't use the preferred pronouns, transgender classmates. Most people don't even know what that means. Uh, and it's crazy. Forced indoctrination is not just an outrage, it's a violation of our dignity and our rights, and the Hispanic community has been against that before it started. You have been, you are the easiest group to talk about this subject to, and I don't want to waste a lot of time on it because you're convinced, you're already convinced, you can't let it happen to our children. As we defend our values at home, we must also defend them on the world stage. As president, I was proud to end the Obama-Biden administration's sellout to the Castro regime and cruel betrayal of the Cuban people. And I was greatly honored to be given the Bay of Pigs Award. Did anyone know that? I received the Bay of Pigs Award. That was a great honor, actually. That's right, right? Do you remember that? Yes. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. You're looking well? Good. Thank you. That was a great honor, actually, for me. And I just did what should be done. It was, you know, I didn't do it to get the award. It was a, an honor, but I did what should be done. And we had them in a position where they were ready to make anything, any deal, freedom, whatever it was going to take. And now they've been empowered again. So has Venezuela been empowered again. I vowed not to lift sanctions until all political prisoners were freed, freedoms of assembly and expression were respected, all political parties were legalized and free elections were scheduled. I said, I'm not lifting them. And everyone said, oh, you've got to lift them. You've got to lift them. As soon as they got in, they lifted everything. They're now back to square one. It's horrible. The Biden administration has completely abandoned the people of Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela. And that's why we did so well in this area. I mean, Venezuela, Doral, which I own, is, uh, they call it Little Venezuela. It's the greatest community, the safest community. What a location. They eased sanctions. They stayed silent. It's brave protesters risked their lives in Cuba. They did nothing as... Catholic clergy were jailed in Nicaragua. They were jailed, many, many of them. And just days ago, Biden traded two narco-terrorists, the nephew of Venezuelan dictator Maduro, for five oil executives charged with corruption, a deal that we could have made any time we wanted. When we get the right leader back in the White House, we must immediately return to the policy of maximum pressure on these very sinister regimes have no choice. And everyone in this room, because you know the situation, we were knocking on the door. It was going to happen very quickly. They, they couldn't have held out any longer. Now, what's, uh, what's been given back is so incredible. It's been just so sad to see it. But we were knocking on the door. Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua. There's so much for our movement to do to save America, the America we love. We need to rapidly expand domestic oil and gas production to restore energy independence immediately, immediately, just like we had two years ago. That'll also help end the war with Russia going into Ukraine. Instead of Biden begging for oil from Maduro, we should be producing it right here in the USA. We should be drilling and bringing it out, bringing it over to Europe. We should be bringing it to Europe, oil and gas. They need it badly. They're going to have a rough winter. You know that. We have to abolish all COVID mandates and lockdowns and rehire every patriot who was fired from the military with an apology and full back pay. Right? We should once again require able-bodied single adults to go to work or train for a job in order to receive welfare and other benefits. You get welfare, you work. They're able-bodied, they have to work. Because we're becoming a nation of welfare right now. If you look at what's happening, it's incredible. It's incredible. A lot of people aren't looking for jobs right now because they make more if they don't work. We need to root out the corruption in our politics and the media. Our media is extremely corrupt. These are corrupt people. Not all of it, but a lot of it and the federal government, and we need to stop the weaponization of federal law enforcement, which goes down to the states, down to the state attorney generals and to the district attorneys. 
and a lot of it comes out of Washington. We have it in New York with a totally corrupt, horrible human being who campaigned, I will get Trump, I will get Trump. What are you going to do? Well, I don't know yet, but I'm going to, when I get in there, I'm going to find out. It's a disgrace. Pam is sitting here shaking your head. It's a disgrace. And everyone knows it, too. It's just a disgrace. And uh, let's see what happens. But people campaign, we're going to get Trump. What did he do wrong? I don't know, but we'll find something. <laughs> and I did such a good job. We're adding up now. I said, add it up. The hundreds of millions of dollars in taxes that I paid over the years in New York City. And it's so sad to see what's happened to New York. And we have an attorney general that's just terrible. No cash bail. No cash bail. Doesn't care about crime. I don't think she cares about crime. We have the murder record. We have the rape record. We have every record you can have. And she doesn't even think about it. Letitia James, she's just done such a disservice. And people are fleeing. They are fleeing New York. They're fleeing New York State. Oh, and that's all over the state, not just New York City. They're fleeing New York State because of crime. And she does nothing about it. Although she did get Cuomo to resign. Very interestingly, uh, a lot of people are angry about that, uh, you know. People liked Cuomo, some people, and I think they'll probably be voting against her, too. But she, is, she ran for governor. And she was doing all this because she wanted to be governor. The only problem was when she ran, she didn't poll. She was at about 2%. She had no poll numbers. And uh, she's just a disaster for the state. But you have people like that, and they're destroying our country. We have to stand up for religious liberty, which is under siege, and in particular for Catholics. You know that. And we need to restore, truly, in particular, we need to restore fair and honest elections, starting with banning unsecured drop boxes and private funding of elections. And finally, voter ID. We have to get voter ID. They don't want voter ID, and they don't want to have any form of check, like, are you a citizen of the country? You can't do that. Can you imagine? Now, there's only one reason they don't want that, those things, is because they want to cheat, and that's what they do. They cheat, and they cheat incredibly well. The goal should be same-day voting with only paper ballots. It's a very simple goal. France just had an election. 36 million people voted. By 11 o'clock in the evening, the election ended and there were no disputes. It's really very nice. And if there were, they go back and they recount the paper ballots. But we do things that are just so horrible. And we do them. It's the Republicans get duped. People like Mitch McConnell, they get duped. Together, we will stop America's decline and we will save our great American dream. We have to save the American dream. For the world, we have to save the American dream because the world is laughing at us and they're looking at us with ridicule. Unlike the radical left, our movement is not based on selfishly thinking only about ourselves and about the short term. Our movement is about life and legacy and the country that we want to pass on to our, our great grandchildren and all of, all of future generations. Our country is in trouble. We never forget that everything America is and all that we cherish was passed down to us by parents and grandparents and great-grandparents who worked and struggled and sweated and sacrificed for our future and for our freedom. These are people that we love so dearly, and we look up and we say, I'm sorry, what happened to our country? What happened? They wouldn't recognize our country. That is the story of America, and that's the story of Hispanic communities all across the land from New York to Los Angeles, from Phoenix to Philadelphia, from Houston to right here in Miami. I love Miami. Our ancestors gave everything they had so that we could live in the most dynamic, exciting, and majestic nation in all of history. We will not let anyone take that nation away from us. We're not going to let this nation go. We will not let socialism or communism we will not let socialism or communism rule our nation, take over our nation, and destroy our country. We will not allow America to be destroyed. The silent majority is back and stronger than ever before. I believe that. <laughs> Two years ago, we were a great nation. And soon, with the help of millions of Hispanic American patriots across this country, we will be a great nation again. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you very much.